Okay. Well, looks good on my end. And, uh, just gonna get the confirmation from my YouTube officer that my voice, my voice is clear and loud, understandable to you. And then we are good to go. So after the delay, this is still a mic tick. So it's not that good. Not that good. So what could be wrong then? So because I'm thinking that I'm using this setup here. Yeah, I think it's this. Is it that it comes with the echo or it comes with, is it too loud? Because I hear what it sounds to me is that they need to be a little too loud. It sounds a bit broken. Broken. Okay. So, so it sounds that uh, it's hard to understand what I'm saying. Okay. So let me see what I could do then. Uh, because it seems to me that I'm using here a mic. Let me let me uh, lock this. So is it making things any better, or is it just all the same all the time? Because I was thinking that today we're gonna go through this without no technical difficulties, but not today. No, it's, it's still. It sounds distorted. Okay. Okay, what is that I can do here? Sometimes it helps. I don't know why it helps to do this. Is it any better? Guess that I need to. What about this? Is it uh, changing anything or is it all the same? It changed, but it's still not. Not that good. Okay, so uh, what if I'm gonna take this mic off here? You know, it's better. Is it not better? It's, it's better. It's better? Yeah. Good. So we're ready to get started. Okay. Simulation of the mechatronic machine lecture number 11. Race back. Very good. Okay, so what, what, what's going to happen? So this course is a consistent of a total of 12 lectures. So after this lecture is only one more lecture to go. So that's a bad news. I have some good news too, because you know there's this follow-up course that will get started in January. Maybe I haven't mentioned, but this course is outstanding. It is really, really good course. It's about, you know, Explain everything to you. You know, after that, you know, all everything makes sense to you, and you figure out everything. So I highly recommend you to participate that course. And honestly, why this course is good? Because it's kind of combining different numerical methods to one package. So we're going to take a look at the multi-body dynamics, of course, as that's my primary discipline. But we're also going to look at the finite element method and how we can combine the finite element method and multi-body dynamics. We're also going to look like how is that we can make advanced actuator models, and then we're going to put a lot of emphasis to real-time simulation and gamification technology. So that's what follows. So please consider to, to sign up to that course. So that will be January, January, whatever the course is, will get started. What now, before it's, the what's that? Name. What's the name of the course? Yeah. Uh, it's a simulation laboratory course. Laboratory course refers to the fact that it used to be a lot of measurements from the laboratory. There is no longer measurements as, uh, you know, we are kind of saving the space and now at the moment there is no measurements involved, of course. But I'm still going to explain the measurement technology here. I mean, that how is it you can, uh, how is that you can read the different sensors and what is the sensor technology, a little bit in that direction. But, you know, what will happen today is that we will go and wrap up the topic of hydraulic modeling. Now the hydraulic modeling, there's a, you know, oh, what's up with this one? So now the pen also is not cooperating with me. I need to connect my pen. Hold on. Here, where is it now? This one. Oh, the pen is connected. Good.
uh, the writing is coming as well. So we're going to wrap up the, the topic of hydraulic modeling. Uh, let me move this away to so make this more visible for you guys. Uh, hold on, hold on. Not that I don't want to solve this, but I want to solve like this. Okay, now it should be nice and clear. Okay, so uh, two more components to discuss in order to, to finalize the hydraulic modeling. So we need to discuss about the, uh, the model of Zuniger, which will be very straightforward, not complicated at all. And then we're going to shortly discuss about the pump model. And those are the, like two extreme in uh, hydraulic circuits, because the pump is the one that is converting the, the mechanical energy to hydraulic power, and uh, the Zuniger is doing the other way around. So it's converting the hydraulic power to mechanical force. So these are the two extremes in the hydraulic circuit. So today we're gonna look at the <coughs> models, and then, uh, then I have an example about how is it you can create the equations needed to solve the, the response of hydraulic circuit. That's what we're gonna discuss a little later today. And then uh, if we have a time, I have a few slides about flexible bodies. It's only a highlight. It's not gonna be any of the heavy theory, but it's just the highlights, kind of like try to build the case why it makes sense to participate in this follow-up course that again will be organized in January. So because it, this is where we're going to combine the finance and the method, multi-body dynamics and many others. So a little bit in that direction and then comes the highlight of the course. You know the highlight of the, highlight of the course is the last lecture which is about the real-time simulation and games. So I have a presentation that is you know, the best that I can build the best lecture that I can make. So I'm not able to make any better than that. So we'll see how you're gonna like it. But unfortunately, it's gonna be not this time, but next time. And by the way, the next time is not gonna be next week because next Tuesday I need to be out of my office. And uh, I will let you know this also through the Moodle website. So I will send you a message, but uh, I need to skip one week. And, uh, then the actual lecture will be 4th of December. So 4th of December, that's, what we're gonna, that's when we will have the last lecture. And in the last, last lecture, there's also some information or the material that I'm expecting you to know when you get, get into second midterm exam. Now the midterm exams are the recommended way to pass the course, but also there is a written exam coming in December, if I remember correctly, that was uh, 20, December 20, that's when there's a written exam. But if you participate in the midterm exam, please skip the written exam. All right? All right, so this is what's gonna happen today. Now let's look at the, what is that we discussed last week. So last week we got started by, by explaining the different type of flows. And we concluded that there are two different types of flows. There's a laminar flow, which takes a place when the pressure difference is small. Numerical value is what's small. Roughly speaking, it's like less than a five bars, less than a four bars. Then it's possible that the flow is laminar in time. And in the laminar flow, what is important is that, you know, in the laminar flow, the flow rate and the pressure difference, oh, hold on, so why, okay, now it's coming. So the flow rate and the pressure difference are linearly related. Now this coefficient that is needed here, that depends on the geometry and uh, where is uh, like the throttle where the flow is traveling through. So it depends on that. But for us, it's important is this relation, so it's a linear relation. Turbulent flow, which is a more common type of flow, that takes a place when the pressure difference is high, so more than a five bars, which typically is the case in mobile applications, typically the case of many of the industrial applications too, and in that, that case, the flow rate and the pressure difference are quadratically related. So that's mathematical relation that is important for us. Which tells what is what? That's gonna be the Reynolds number, so we can compute the Reynolds number and compare that against the critical Reynolds number if the value turns out to be lower than the critical Reynolds number, then you may expect that the flow type is laminar. Another way around, if it is larger than the critical Reynolds number, you can expect the flow to be third length in time. And that's what the in-class quiz was last week. 
almost 100% success rate, but not quite. Quite hard. Okay. But look, I'm not even saying that today is going to be 100% success rate, because most probably it will not. My questions today are difficult, very, very difficult. We will see. We'll see how you got, how you're scoring. Then uh, also last week we discussed about semi-empirical modeling approach. Idea is clear. So the idea is that we will get started from the analytical equations, and then we're doing the mathematical manipulation in order to convert the equation in a form that the unknown parameters can be obtained from the manufacturer's cutoff. So that's the concept. Example is here. So here is a analytical equation that describes the flow rate through the throttle that is shown here. So I have here a circular shape of, of throttle, and the diameter of the throttle is D. And I'm comparing how much flow is traveling through this uh, circular shape of the throttle. And it uh, depends quadratically on the pressure. And this is the equation that uh, accounts everything. So I have here discharge coefficient, diameter, and the density of the fluid. But what I'm doing here is that I'm converting the parameters that are this time two unknowns, d and discharge coefficient, to be expressed by one parameter only. And the one parameter is CV here, which is a semi empirical parameter. This is the one you can get from the manufacturer's cutoff. So this is the concept. That's how it works. Okay? Then uh, we also, last week, we looked at the direction valve, and we concluded that the model of the direction valve consists of two parts. First part is uh, the one where we are looking at the spool position. Uh, we are modeling the spool position using a simple first order delay equation. Oh no, so this is a delay equation. So what I have here is an input signal. So this is the signal that is coming from the user, joystick or uh, control algorithm or whatever the signal is coming out. It, uh, it, it will be read it here. This is a kind of the actual representation of spool position, and this is a time delay. So it's telling you how fast the spool position can react, the, the, the position changes. And now, by solving this first order differential equation, you can have an estimate where the spool is located at any given time. <coughs> now, once you have a spool position solved, then the flow through the component can be computed by using these three different scenarios. So now if the spool is having the positive value, meaning that it's traveling in this picture, this direction, these are the flows. And if it is in the middle position, we are assuming that there is no flow whatsoever. And if it is negative value, meaning that the spool is traveling uh, this, this right hand <coughs> direction, and then these are the equations that I need. So it was this quite simple, straightforward concept. Then I promised to explain about digital hydraulics. And uh, last week I mentioned that digital hydraulics is, uh, is all about uh, different uh, simple puppet valves. And you can uh, open and close the puppet valves in a certain order. And you can kind of have a representation of spool that is moving back and forth. To make this topic clear, I want to play you a video. And we'll see how this video will be, how I'm going to play, how I'm, how I'm actually able to play this for you. So let's see. I'm going to first move here. OK, so then I'm going to move to this slide. Okay, so this is not the way to go. So then I'm gonna take another option. This other option was working at least in my office, so we'll see how it works here. Ah, okay, so all my participants cannot see this. Okay, so one more option. So this is a third option. So I'm going to change the view to be uh, so this camera going to add here window 
browser, let me use a Okay, so is this a... Oh, not that. I don't want to put it there. Browser here. Okay, let me see. How it, uh, how it looks? Is it anything going out? Uh, yeah. Is it this the same view that you can see here or uh, another view? Yeah, yeah. Oh, so it looks like that right now. Okay, so it's not the one that I wanted to, to display to you. Okay, so let me change this one to be... <coughs> display going to use simply this one. So it's looked a little bit ugly at the moment, but soon it's going to look better. So, uh, so now let's play. The voice is off. Yeah, voice is off. Uh, not this one. This one. Visual hydraulic system, which has many different types. Can you hear that? A digital fiddle hydraulics. The system variables, pressure and flow, are controlled with multiple on-off directional seat valves. Each valve is solenoid operated and has only two possible positions: on and off. This is why the term digital is used. These valves are used to implement all valve functions, such as pressure, flow, and directional control. Contrary to a traditional hydraulic system, which has many different types of valves, a digital hydraulic system has a large number of only on-off valves. By connecting in parallel three on-off valves of different sizes, such as one, two, and four, seven different flow quantities can be achieved. Five on-off valves can achieve the control resolution of a traditional proportional valve. A group of on-off valves in parallel make up a digital flow control unit, called DFCU. At least four of these units are needed to substitute a proportional valve in a hydraulic circuit. Each DFCU is used to control one of the four control edges. The main benefit of digital hydraulics is the ability to control each control edge independently. This reduces power loss and enables precise control. Additionally, seat valves have zero leakage, as opposed to the high leakage of proportional valves. However, the challenge with digital hydraulics is the complexity of the control algorithm. Each valve needs to be controlled individually, and this results in large numbers of valve position combinations, although each valve has only two possible positions. Okay, you got it? You got the concept. What is a why the what is a digital hydraulics? You got the concept, or well, you're not sure? <laughs> so, oh, not this. No, we don't want to look that anymore. Okay, but so how is it? Is it uh, clear or unclear? Okay, let me close this. And then I need to go back to this one. I think I need to. <coughs> so let me ask again. So is it? Clear? Can I ask this in a written exam? What's a digital hydraulic? So what's the benefit of the digital hydraulics? I can. What's the drawback of the digital hydraulics? That too is clear. Okay. I trust you then. <laughs> there is no way. Okay, hold. You can relax. There is no each last quizzes related to this. But take a look at the, the YouTube. The link for the YouTube video is actually you know, here. So this is the link you can use. So take a look at that. Take a look at the digital hydraulics in a sense that if I ask simple concept question related to digital hydraulics, then you're able to answer that. Okay? Deal? Clear? Good. Okay. So then uh, 
as I mentioned, two more components. Press the relief valve will be a reading assignment. I'm certainly going to explain what's the deal with the uh, press the relief valve. This is a quick, complicated model, but the idea is still straightforward. And the idea is this, you know, press the relief valve is something that there is a moving uh, component, that's a spool. And the spool is, uh, you know, is operated by a pressure that is applying here in, in this part of the, the spool. And the pressure, you know, and then the flow force that is traveling through to this, this orifice that is here. So maybe I need to change the color to make this more visible. So the pressure is applying here. And this is where the flow is traveling through the pressure relief valve. You know, the concept of the model will be actually made such the way that you first create the equation of motion for this ball. So you have the mass of this ball, multiplied by acceleration of this ball, uh, spring coefficient, which is the one that is here. And there is a pretension of the, of the spring that is accounted in, uh, okay, so this is supposed to be O. So this is uh, where the spring coefficient, or the preloaded is, uh, is uh, affecting. There is a flow force and the pressure force. And then once you know the spool position, then you can use this flow equation to compute how much actually flow is traveling through the pressure relief valve. That's the concept. And these are the analytical equations. And then what follows is a heavy mathematical manipulation. Because right now we have a serious problem in our model. And the problem is that we have a lot of parameters that we don't know what they stand for and how we can get them. We know what are the physical interpretation of the parameter, say a mass of the spool, and the spring constant and the coefficient and so on and so on. We all know what they are standing for, what is the interpretation. But to get the numerical value of them, that's going to be hard. That's going to be very difficult to find. So. We wanted to use a manufacturer's catalog again, so we're going to use a series of mathematical manipulation. And as a result of that, you know, that our spool position will be evaluated by using a simple first order differential equation. So look, there is a great simplification <coughs> here, because look, that here the equation of motion is a second order differential equation as I have here, x dot dot. Now after this mathematical manipulation, I'm kind of building the case and saying, okay, I can estimate the spool position using this simple first order reference equation. And once I know that, then it goes to this, uh, this equation, which tells how much flow is actually traveling through the pressure relief valve. So you may read the details from the lecture notes, but this is uh, like a little bit extra material. If you're really scoring uh, extra high points of the written exam, say that you want to have, you know, possible, you know, the maximum points, then it makes sense to, to read this. But if you're comfortable with the five, not the five plus, but the five out of five, then you may skip this. Because this is a little difficult component. The next component is not at all difficult, and it's going to be a hydraulic cylinder. And as I mentioned, the idea of the cylinder is to convert the, mechan the, the hydraulic power to mechanical force. And that's exactly what it's doing. And uh, you know this is a simple uh, model for two-way hydraulic cylinder, and it is as simple as it sounds here. You know, I have here a cylinder where the pressure is applying here in the piston side. You know that pressure will be multiplied by a corresponding cross-section area. So the cross-section area is denoted as a1, and that is multiplied by p1, and that's the force that is pushing the piston to this direction. But as this is a two-way cylinder. There's another force that is applying in this particular actuator, and that's the one that is applying here in the piston rod side. In the piston rod side, the pressure is assumed to be P2, that is multiplied by a corresponding cross section area. <coughs> what is a cross section area? It's going to be, you know, this. Well, let's let's put it this way. So it's going to be A1 minus the cross section of the piston rod. How can I put that? Of the cylinder rod, cylinder rod. So this is uh, the one that you, I have to take it off from the A1, and that's uh, where the A2 is actually coming from. And then the final component that is the only one that is a little difficult is the friction. Friction is applied because uh, you know there is a ceilings in uh, two different locations of the hydraulic cylinder. 
first of all, there are ceilings that is uh, preventing for the oil to travel from piston to piston roadside and other way around. So ceilings are introducing quite a bit of friction. And then there's another ceilings that are actually preventing oil to come off from the piston roadside, go off from the outside from the cylinder. And this poor location where the ceilings are affecting will cause the friction force here. And the friction force is a little bit of special type of friction force that is typically affecting in hydraulic cylinders. Uh, special type in the sense that you know if you really want to make an accurate model about the friction because of the ceilings, this is going to be complicated, very complicated because the pressure, pressures in two different chambers, they will affect the friction force. Standing and running times will affect the friction forces. Because you know, if you keep on running you know, you know, all the time and you stop just for a fraction of the second and you move again, then the friction will behave differently than standing there half a day. You know, then there is a friction material that will affect. Is there a comment about my voice? No. Okay, good. So th that's actually extremely complicated to build the correct estimation about the friction. So what is that we doing then? Is that we are using a simple polynomial to express roughly how the friction is behaving. Because there is something that is quite important in the behavior of the cylinder friction, and it is something that is called stick slip friction. I'm sure you have heard this before. You know, thick slip is something that, you know, the, the standing, maybe it's better to explain it in this way, that if I have here, you know, relative velocity between the two bodies, you know, this is a case where the box is standing in a flat surface like this. And I'm pushing this box to the right hand direction. You know, then there is a friction that is preventing box to slide in the beginning. Now, this is the relative velocity between the, the box and the crown, and here is a, you know, maybe I can put it here like friction force. It could be this way. You know, there could be, you know, you keep on increasing the force, you know, this force that is applying in the box until it reaches the static friction. And as soon as it reaches the static friction, what will happen is that the, the box will start sliding. All right? So you're increasing the power, give me the force, and as soon as you, let's say that the static friction uh, is here, as soon as you reach this point, then the box starts sliding, and as soon as it started to sliding, the friction actually getting smaller. And it's kind of like pushing the, the box rapidly forward, and then what will happen is that typically the force is unable to follow that, and then, you know, what happened is that, you know, it's sliding, and then it stopped again. And it's moving between these, you know, in this part of the curve, and this is what is called stick, like stick slip friction. And the example about the stick slip friction is like, no, let me see, where is that I can find an example? All these, there are rolls all over, no. No. Okay, here. No. Oh, yeah. It was. Okay. Oh, you hear that? Yeah. No. Okay, the experiment is not so great. Why is not cooperating with me? But you know, it makes it kind of like a funny, like a little bit like this type of this, not that type of the no, noise. And uh, no, not that. Okay, never mind. But you got the concept. You got the concept. So that's because of the friction behavior when uh, the static friction is higher than the, the sliding friction. And this is typically what happens in hydraulic suit. And it comes with this noise. Okay, so you got it. Clear? Clear. Okay, so I don't need to make a uh, fool of myself. I already did that already. Right? <laughs> so too late. Okay, but that's all right because it only goes to YouTube, so it's not that many people that see that. So <laughs> okay, so uh, here's an example of how that you can model the friction. And then I have here experiment that kind of demonstrate this stick slip behavior. 
And the friction force, you can model by using a polynomial. And the polynomial is something that, you know, it is, uh, it is actually made by using a curve fitting technique such that it is traveling like here through the origin and like this. So it's like, kind of like a, a, and this is a relative velocity, this is this xx dot. So v is equal to x dot. So that's, that's my polynomial. And the polynomial is kind of like a representation of sticks. Like there is a minor problem. And the minor problem is that, you know, because the, the curve is crossing the origin here, in case of zero velocity, there is no actually no static friction at all. But, you know, we have to do it this way because, you know, if we want to have a continuous function that describes uh, the friction, you know, this is pretty much the only way. There are more advanced technologies or more advanced ways to describe the friction, but they are based on like loop curve friction models and others, which will be a little more complicated to explain in this particular case. But just for your knowledge, with the loop curve friction, it is possible to have something that in the friction gets started here and is started here. But this, you know, using the polynomial will be discontinuity so severe that the computation will not be successful. So that's why we're using this polynomial that is traveling through the, ori through the origin of this curve. It's a kind of like somewhat representation of stick slip behavior. Now, here are the measurements that are made using the, you know, this is written in Finnish, which I need to apologize. But this, by the way, I think it's pretty much the only picture and only material that is in written in Finnish. And I was unable to find that in English book. So here is a, you know, relative velocity. So this is the x dot, and this is a friction force. And you see that how it behaves. These are the different pressures applied in a cylinder. And you see how it behaves. And the friction clearly goes down when the, when the relative velocity is very low. And that's because that's the one that is causing this stick slip effect. Stick slip may be something that I might ask. Okay, what's a stick slip? Where that is coming from? So where that is coming from? It's coming from the fact that the static friction is, uh, is a higher than the sliding friction. And that the system is, uh, is moving back and forth between these two extremes, standing and uh, sliding friction, and it's causing like non-smooth motion. So something is sliding, stopping, sliding, stopping, sliding, stopping. Okay, clear. Uh, okay, so it will be that sort of explanation about the cylinder. Then we're going to move on to pump. In a pump, I have my first in class quiz. So, heads up. You ready? Yeah. Because I'm going to ask how is it we can model that the pump? What is the quantity that describes the pump model? Now, the idea of the pump model is that we have to create a model that using the flow rate. So, the pump is considered as a source of flow rate, not the source of the pressure. Because pressure comes as soon as you're restricting the flow rate. But the pump itself is not anything, it's not anything else than just the, you know, the kind of the mechanisms that produce the flow rate. So flow is that the ones that go to the system, and as soon as you're preventing the flow to travel further from certain location, that's when the pressure started to increase. But that kind of makes sense, because remember we have this equation P dot equal to the, the effective mod modulus divided by volume. And then we have here flow rate that is coming in, a flow rate that is going up. Now if we have here dead end here, this space, you know, the flow rate keeps on coming to system, so is this one here. So the delta P keep on increasing, the suppressor will increase. So that what happens. So we always, when we're making the pump models, we also always considering that to be the one that is producing the flow rate in the system. So the pressure is a consequence of the flow rate. But the actual quantity that we're using to model the pump would be the flow rate. That's exactly what I'm gonna ask you in a class quiz that will be available soon, okay? Not the pressure, but the flow rate. Okay, clear. All right, so uh, you know, then there is a you know, different kind of pump types and then the, the mechanically how they look, they could be gear bump, wind bump, piston bump, 
piston pump may be the most frequently used. So this is the one that we should actually take a look at. So, but you know, the other type of the pumps are available too. The most simple pump is a fixed displacement pump. So this is a very, you know, very straightforward concept. So this is a pump to keep on producing the flow, keep on producing energy to system, no matter if it is needed in a hydraulic circuit or not. So typically, you know, the, you know, the simple setup that is uh, where the pump is used is what we have, I have here a pump that is operated by a motor here, and that is uh, producing the flow rate to system. So this goes to hydraulic circuit. If there is a dead end, say that there is a direct valve in a middle position, then we have no need for hydraulic flow or power or anything. So then just to make sure that the flow comes back to the tank, so we can have here pressure relief valve that looks like this. And that's where the pressure goes back to the tank. Now in a fixed volume pump, the pump keep on producing the energy to the system. So what happens here is this is, let's say, say that this is a dead end, so we don't need energy in the system. And the pump keep on producing the flow in the system. So the pressure will start increasing. And it increase and increase until it hits the set pressure of the pressure relief valve. So the set pressure of this component. So what happens after that is that the pressure relief valve, you know, the piston or the, the spool will go to the open position and flow goes through back to the tank. And that's the, you know, the simple scenario how you can use a fixed volume pump. Energy-wise, if you think about you know, saving energy, this is not so great idea. Because you know, here is a motor that is keep on pumping, you know, no matter if the energy is needed in a hydraulic circuit or not. And the pump keep on producing the flow rate, no matter if it is needed or not. And then eventually it goes back to the tank through the story phases, you simply heating the oil, nothing else. So this is not a very clever solution. And because of this you know, very bulk idea, this is not that much used anymore. But sometimes the fixed volume pump is considered to be very reliable because it's a reliable, it used to be a quite popular in an industrial application. But right now when the energy saving is very much in fashion, it doesn't really make much sense to use this type of the pump. But this is the simplest possible pump. The model that describes the pump will be based on these two equations. So you basically have to compute uh, how is the maximum flow rate that this system can produce based on the volume displacement and then the, the, the power produced by this, or power applied to the pump. So basically what I'm doing here is that I'm using this uh, simple uh, equation which says that the power is equal to the flow rate multiplied by pressure. So the P is a pressure, capital P is a power. And now using this equation, I can have an estimation and I can actually estimate how much the flow is actually coming from the pump, fixed volume pump. So I'm simply solving the Q from this equation by you know, taking the pressure out the side of the equation and taking the efficiency, this one here, which is called mu. Yes. No. Yes. Nu. No. Yes. Eta. Yes. Eta. So it's eta. It's called eta. And that's, uh, that's uh, telling us what is the efficiency of the pump. Typically, we are speaking about the numbers that are quite high. Uh, 0 0.9, 0 0.95 could be that high. So that is a one equation. Another equation, like what's the this, you know, what's the maximum flow rate based on the geometry of the pump? So you just compute these numerical values and then you select the one that is producing the lower value. So you see that the one that is restricted by the geometry or the one that is restricted by the power. So it's simple like that. But like I explained, you know, the uses of this fixed displacement pump is not very clever because it's keep on producing energy to the system and basically, it goes such the way that here, you're putting energy to the system, here you're taking off energy from the system. Nothing happens. 
It's not even needed in the system, but you keep on doing this all the time. But this is very reliable, very you know bulk design, so it's you know sometimes used. But if you want to have something more clever than that, then you should actually move on to variable displacement pump. A variable displacement pump is way more clever in the sense that it can actually adjust the flow rate that is coming off from the pump. And there are many different ways how you can control that. So it could be as simple as, you know, you have a pump here that is operated by a motor here. Flow rate lives here. And then you just want to make sure that the pressure right off the pump have to be within the certain set pressure. And you have here a pilot that is like a measuring the, the, the pressure right after the pump, which is this particular location. And you're saying that, you know, the pressure here must be pressure, say, reference pressure must be equal than 200 pounds. Okay, so you keep on producing the flow in the system, but as soon as the flow, excuse me, as soon as the pressure hits the 200 bars, then it's actually no longer producing more energy in the system, but instead it's actually making the volume, the flow rate to be equal to zero. How that happens? Uh, there is a different mechanisms to make that happen, but for us, the model looks like this. Remember, in the past, you know, the, you know, the fixed displacement pump, we compared directly the flow rate. And again, the pumps are always the flow rate models, not the pressure models, but the flow rate. Flow rate. Flow. That's what we compute. Now, here we're going to have a Q dot. So this is a simple first order differential equation to kind of the model to delay because the pump kind of change the, its volume rate like rapidly like this. But it always takes a little bit of delay. You know, the parameters that I need here is a time constant again, which means like how fast the pump can react to new operation condition. And then I have here the reference pressure, which is the set pressure here. And then the, you know, the actual pressure, which is the one that you measure. So if this channel here is a PP. And then the QD, QP here and the K here is a parameter that you can get from the manufacturer's cut. So this is the constant pressure control. Constant pressure meaning that always right after the pump, the constant pressure is available. And it is adjusting the flow rate such that it is always available. Still not very clever idea. There are better ways to introduce the control. And the one of the ways that is quite heavily used at the moment is called load sensing control. And load sensing is like extension of this, uh, this constant pressure control. Now what you're doing is that you're measuring the pressures in different locations close to your actuators and making sure that the pressures close to your actuators is always, a, you know, within the certain limit. So you're kind of making sure that if there's a cylinder and there's a pressure in the cylinder that is right now is 100 bars, you make sure that the pressure here that is available will be 150 bars. Based on your face, maybe a little hard to understand this concept, but let's look at the YouTube. Because in the YouTube, there is a very clear explanation how is a load sensing control. So let's take a look. Here, I need to first click the here to get this uh, link. Oh, and then I need to stop this. Okay. Right now is working at 300 p.m. 
psi. That's the pressure it takes to lift the cylinder and run it. And then 300 psi is being fed back to the controller and giving that spring a boost. I can tell that the spring is actually set to 300 psi. How did I figure that out? I figured that out because our pump outlet pressure is set at 600. So it's taking 300 from the load and adding it to the 300 spring setting those two pressures add together, those two forces add together to give us our regulated pump outlet pressure of 600 psi. This is different from a pressure compensated pump which might be set at say 2000 psi at all times and therefore using a lot more input energy. So in this particular case we've got a pump that sets its outlet pressure just slightly higher than what's needed by the load. We've got to have some kind of a flow controlling device in there. This is our needle valve that's being used to set our desired cylinder stroke speed. But let's have a look at what happens when I add a brick to the brick stacker. Ah, our low pressure has gone up to 600. But what happened to our pump outlet pressure? Somehow it automatically adjusted from 600 up to 900. What we're finding out is that we're always maintaining a 300 psi pressure differential, sometimes referred to as a 300 psi margin pressure when we're referring to load sense systems. Let's add one more brick, but this time watch the delta P gauge. All the delta P gauge fluctuates for a brief fraction of a second, but quickly we find it returns to 300 psi, and we never really noticed any change in the speed of the cylinder. The cylinder just kept moving nice and steady, and our pump found out that it needed to increase the outlet pressure setting automatically. So what we found out is we can have a pump that is set at a pressure that's just a little higher than what's needed at the load, instead of being always at the pressure cutoff pressure, which can be considerably higher. And because we know we want steady speeds to our hydraulic cylinder, we don't wish to see any fluctuation in speed. Every time we take a brick off the stack, or every time we add a brick to the stack, the pump knows to adjust itself accordingly so that the flow rate through the needle valve doesn't change. That's the nature of a load sense system, and that's a brief introduction to load sense pumps. Thanks for watching. Call, call from the smudge box. Okay, so you got it. So the idea is that, you know, this needle valve is in reality, that's a direction valve. You know, that over the direction valve, we can, you know, maintain the pressure difference to be within the certain predefined pressure difference. So if there is a need for additional pressure in the hydraulics, you know, pump kind of sensing that. So it's sensing that, you know, assume there is a need for additional pressure. So let me do the adjustment. So that, that is always available. And now if there is not need to have a pressure, that is also adjusting itself such that it's not producing, you know, energy to the system. So that's why energy-wise, this is the kind of the clever solution. And now, particularly when you look at the mobile applications, this is a, you know, very much used procedure to control the pump. Because in a mobile application, it's all about the hydraulic efficiency. You know, you want to make it efficient, but the concept of hydraulics is very difficult in that, particularly if you're using fixed volume pump. You keep producing energy to the system. Whatever you're introducing, the pressure difference you're introducing, the pre your energy losses as well. And now, when you're you know, producing system energy to the system, and then you you know take the energy back to the tank through the pressure relief valve, this makes no sense energy wise. So this is a little bit more clever way to do this. Okay, so now can we have a five minutes break, and then after break we're gonna you know. I have what I have. Okay, so you can kind of see what I have here. But I will uh, kind of, you know, have one example. Then the in-class squeeze is related to. Oh, by the way, don't go yet because I'm going to show you the in-class squeeze related to hydraulics. And then uh, you can answer. You can make your answer during the break. Uh, this have to be off. Okay, so we're back here. Okay, so this was a video. So this is a model, so I'm gonna get back to the load sensing model. And then the, this is where the K is actually coming from, this unknown parameter. So you get that from the manufacturer's catalog. 
And my question is also it should be class squeeze number one. So in a hydraulic model, the pump is assumed to produce pressure for the hydraulic circuit, oil flow for the hydraulic circuit, temperature for the hydraulic circuit, voltage to electrical circuit. So sure, should. So there's a better type of There seems to be a wrong question in that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Put it on. So it's Okay, take a look at now. Okay, so uh, I'm sure this is confusing because the last option should be circuit. So there is a typing mistake. So it's a high electrical circuit. Electrical circuit is the, the option number four. Okay, so now what I'm gonna do is that I'm gonna close the streaming and I close the recording. We're gonna have a five minute break and after break, there's one example related to hydraulics, and then we're going to move on.